Good. Our next speaker is Dr. Claudius Gläser. Um, you need to have uh, this one, right? So Claudius holds PhD degree in computer science from the Bielefeld University. In 2011, he joined uh, Robert Bosch uh, GmbH, where he developed perception algorithms for various driver systems and highly automated driving functions. He leads uh, a research group on perception for automated driving at the Bosch Research in Renningen. Um, until 2011, he was also a re re research scientist with the Honda Research Institute um, in Offenbach, uh, where he was working on the fields in speech processing and language understanding for um, uh, humanoid uh, robots and his research interests include multimodal perception and data fusion for autonomous systems. So that's a perfect match for our workshop today. Welcome, Darius. Okay, so welcome everybody and thanks again for the kind introduction. So I'm Claudius, uh, I'm from Bosch Research. I'm heading this research group about uh, perception and fusion for automated driving. And in my today's talk, I would like to speak a bit about uh, the domain gaps that we encounter in data perception and our approaches and how we want to bridge them. As a motivation uh, of my talk, I would like to show you first this small video. So this is not a highly polished demo drive, but this is basically our day-to-day -day, uh, working style. So we are working on uh, automated driving for sure, and basically on the whole stack of automated driving. So basically on the whole stack, so from perception and fusion um, up to prediction and planning. And of course, we, we try to improve those individual components, so we try to develop new models, new solutions for them, and do this as you do it as well. So using some pre-recorded data, some labeled data sets. But as soon as we think they are mature enough, we try to bring them in the test field as well. And this is basically what you see here. These are the first steps in testing new algorithms on the road. And this is actually quite interesting each time when we do this, because what we usually encounter is that it does not work, at least at the very beginning. Yeah. So we usually see a large performance drop. So the models do not show the performance that we would expect, given the data sets that we used before, at least the result that we saw in the data sets. And the reason for this is quite simple. The, the data in the, in the car is different to the data we trained on. And these are basically the domain gaps that we encounter and that we somehow have to care about. So as I said, my home turf is more the, the perception and fusion. And one of the aspects that we are working on is uh, object detection using a different sensor modalities. So the goal here is that you try to estimate where objects are given the raw sensor data. Yeah. Here you will see uh, radar reflections, so radar point clouds, lidar point clouds, as well as camera band 360 degree images around the vehicle. And the goal is to, to say where are the other traffic participants, what kind of traffic participants are there, so the classification of them, as well as the regression of the boundaries. So the extent orientation uh, of the objects. And in my today's talk, I will focus on the middle part. So using LIDAR point clouds to perform object detection. And this is basically a reminder to what, <coughs> what uh, Fabian already has said at the beginning in the opening of the workshop. So these are the domain, domain gaps that we usually encounter when we, when we deploy our week. Uh, the, our models to the vehicles. The most important ones are the ones on the left. So usually, or what we what we often have is that we just have a switch in the sensor that is used. So data sets have been recorded with some kind of sensor, but our vehicle is equipped with a new sensor, with next generation sensor, for example. Of course, we want to reuse the data that we already gathered, and so we have to 
find some approaches to adapt to this new sense. The same is true for weather. So if we have a look at uh, the available data sets out there, so Newsweek, Kitty, and so on, usually they have been reported in nice weather. And unfortunately, at least in southern Germany, you have a lot of rain. In Ulm, you have a lot of fog. And <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Something else. And of course, this uh, affects performance as well and location. So, I mean, the scenes and data look pretty different if you are operating on a highway in the inner city or rural road. For sure. So, as I said, I will focus on LIDAR perception, basically on object detection uh, using LIDAR data. And I will talk about the domain gaps. And I structured my talk as follows. In the first step, I would like to talk a bit about the origin of the domain gap. So we try to understand why those domain gaps affect our models. And once I said or talked about the origin, then I will show different approaches, basically three, um, that we used to, to bridge those domain gaps. And then finally, I conclude the talk. So let's start with the understanding of the domain. Gap. I will focus on these two. The first one is the sensor domain gap that I already mentioned. So you train using one sensor and you want to deploy on a vehicle or some, some yeah, other, other platform to test another sen uh, sensor equipment. And we investigated this domain gap using a data set where two different sensors have been recorded simultaneously. Yeah, in this case, there's a sensor set where uh, we had a relevant sensor at the roof of the meter. So a 32 layer one that we used the, the ultra book. And as a second sensor, we used the HESA the panda sensor, which has 64 layers. And as you can see, the coin part of the HESA sensor is uh, much denser and also has a narrow uh, vertical peak. The second gap is the weather gap. So there we differentiate between clear weather or nice weather condition. It's basically when weather is clear or when it's cloudy, when, when the road is dry. Bad weather condition would be that it's raining, either in a light way, heavy way, the snow, the, the, the street is wet or flooded, and so on. And these are the domain gaps that we observe when we uh, when we apply our model so on the, on the left hand side you you see that we train the model using a high resolution sensor and then we evaluate the model either on a high resolution or a low resolution sensor. And as you can see with the high resolution sensor we get the average precision of 72 percent the absolute values doesn't tell much because it's very dependent on the data set um, but what is what you can see is if you apply the same model on the low resolution sensor, the performance uh, drops down and it drops down significantly to 58%. And the same can be also observed in the weather gap. So here we do not change the sensor, we just change the environmental conditions. We train in clear weather and then we deploy in clear weather or bad weather. And as you can see, clear weather condition gets 82%, bad weather conditions drops to the And the reason for this is basically in both of those domain gaps, it boils down to the missing point gap. So on the left hand side, uh, you see a plot where we uh, plot the average number of points that are on an object with respect to the distance of the object. And this plot is not surprising for LIDAR sensor. It basically says that you have more points on an object if the object is close. If the, the object gets far away, you get less. And it's also not surprising that the high resolution sensor gives you more points on the object than the low resolution sensor. But what is uh, um, quite nice is basically you see the same effect in the weather condition. Yeah? You have good weather, then you get more points on the object. You have bad weather, you get less points on the object. And why is this important? Because um, object detection performance is strongly correlated with the number of points you have on the object. This is basically shown by this plot. So you need a certain amount of points on the object to reach a recall over your um, um, data set. And in this case here, for this experiment, 
if you want to reach 50% recall, so you want to detect 50% of the objects that are in your data set, then you need at least 40 points on average on your object. If you have more points, you are able to detect more objects. If you have less points on your object, the probability that you miss some of them um, increases. So knowing that it's basically a missing point problem, now we go on to different approaches that we evaluated and that could be used for bridging this domain. And there are tons of approaches out there. Some of them operate more at the feature level. So they try to adapt the, the features that are learned by the neural new, new network. And others operate more on the data level. I will show you that there are different approaches which basically, basically cover this, this whole spectrum. The first one that I will talk about is a quite classical one, is this gradient, uh, gradient reversal layer. As I said, it's quite classical, already has been proposed in 2015, but it's uh, always good to, to have some baseline approach. Um, and this gradient reversal layer, it gives you a already good baseline. So what's the idea of this approach? You, you have your classic uh, object detection pipeline, so comprising the backbone. This backbone generates some feature map, and on top of this feature map, you just apply a detection hat that tells you where an object is and how the dimensions are. So you regress the parameters. Now the idea of this uh, gradient reversal layer is basically that you, um, Additionally, you apply an auxiliary task. Yeah, you use your feature map, and on top of the feature map, you uh, add an additional domain classifier. And the task of this domain classifier is that it should classify from which domain your data comes from. Does it come from the nice weather condition or from the bad weather condition? And if you now try, uh, try to train this domain classifier, you back propagate the gradient, and the gradient would somehow. Um, yeah, encourage or emphasize those features that are able to distinguish between those different domains. You know, now the key idea is that you reverse this gradient, so you try not to distinguish the domains, but you try the feature map to become robust against such domain shifts. Yeah? You, you try to develop some domain independent features. So if you do this, you get the following results. And let me shortly explain um, the table. So this is the condition uh, where we evaluate our model on. So either a nice weather condition or a bad weather condition. And then we have three columns. On the left column, this is basically the baseline without any gradient reversal layer. And there you can see the domain gap that I already mentioned. Yeah? We have a domain gap of 5.8% in mean average position. Uh, uh, with respect, nice to bad weather conditions. Then we can also say, well, we can have an upper bound. So, in addition to the nice labels or the nice uh, uh, data with labels, we can we have labels also for the bad weather domain. Yeah, and if you just train on both of these domains, all using labels, then you can see we get even better, and we are also better in in the gap. Yeah, we, we are able to reduce the gap from 5.8% to 4.2%. And we consider this to be the upper bound because we have labels available in both domains. Now, the middle column this is basically the approach that we use. We just have labels available in the, in the good weather condition, but no labels in the bad weather condition. And what you can see are two things. The first thing, this is maybe a bit surprising, is that even though you don't have any label in the bad weather condition, if you add them to the to the training, you are you even improve in the nice weather condition. Yeah. So gradient reversal layer training also improves performance in the source domain, not only in the target domain. The effect that we wanted to achieve is that we close the inference gap. And this is what you can also see. We are able to reduce the inference gap to approximately 50%. Yeah, so 50% is closed, and 50% of the gap is still open. So, conclusion for this method 
it's fully unsupervised. Yeah, you just need data from the target domain, but you don't need any label from the target domain. Um, the domain gap can be bridged, but there's still some gap left. So still some gap that has to be closed. And what PASA does is basically it's a feature level domain adaptation. Yeah, you adapt the features, but you don't really care about the origin of the domain gap. It does not address this missing point problem, at least not directly, just implicitly. And that's why our second approach tried to directly address the missing point pattern. We call it the self supervised pattern predict task. So, what's the idea here? Setup is quite similar to before. You, you have your pipeline for object detection, your backbone and detection head. Now you're using a different auxiliary task. So, instead of classifying the domain, you uh, try to perform some, well, semantic point classification, some four, uh, four point classification. So, we add a point head. And the task of the set is basically to tell what times uh, or what points of the of the input uh, point cloud belong to a foreground object, belong to a car, for example. So this is the classic foreground segmentation task. And now you can extend this foreground uh, segmentation task by this height and predict scheme. We could just drop out some of the points in the input image and ask the network to do the point completion for the output. Yeah? And by doing this, you somehow drive the model or, or uh, force the model to develop some feature which helps you to, to work with different point densities at the input. Yeah? You can use the full input point cloud, but also a less input point cloud. And then network has to learn some, some well, scene understanding or some, some shape understanding such that it is able also to complete the, uh, the, the point plot to point plot completion. And our hope was, of course, that this helps also um, for, the, for the object detection task. Let's have a look at the results. Now, the numbers are different because the, the, um, the domain gap that we investigate here is a different one. So we, not the weather gap anymore, but the slider to lighter gap. We trained on the high resolution sensor and evaluated either on high resolution or low resolution. And as you can see, if you switch to the low resolution sensor, you get this huge inference gap of 13%. If we now um, apply our hybrid predict task, we are able to reduce this inference gap at least to, to some extent. Of course, it's still huge. So 12% inference gap is still huge. But what is also interesting again, you also generally improve your performance on the high resolution sensor. Yeah, so, so this high and predict task as an auxiliary task can also serve as a general augmentation method. Yeah, you can just use it, augment your data, use this auxiliary task, and you will, your network will become better even in source community. So conclusion, this is a self-supervised domain adaptation method. So here you don't need any data from the target domain. Yeah, you just use source domain data and, and use it to self-supervise itself. It directly addresses the missing point gap. But to be honest, since we directly address the origin of the domain gap, we would have expected a, a larger or better performance. Yeah, we still have a huge gap open that has to be bridged. Now we wondered why this is the case. Well, one reason could be that we just apply some random dropout at the input. So we randomly drop some of the points. And of course, this, yeah, this, ne this neglects any characteristics of the sensor. And if we know how the target sensor looks like, if we exactly know what the specification of the target sensor is, then maybe we are better if we directly use this. And this brings me to the last method, sensor emulation. So what's the idea here with sensor emulation? So we have a large data set recorded and labeled. Yeah? And this data set 
comprises a lighter font plot and respective label. Now, what if we would be able to emulate this new sensor using this existing lighter font plot? So think of a uh, generated data set as if we would have recorded the data with the new sensor. If we know the specification of this new LiDAR sensor, then we can emulate it in the following way. As a first step, we just use the field of view of this new sensor. So we cut out all the points that fall into this field of view and um, project it in some kind of field of view. Yeah? And this generates this star step image. Then via some really simple morphological operations, we try to close the gaps in the sparse step image, generating some dense step image. And now we come back again to the sensor specification. We use the specification and resemble from this dense step image. So, for example, concerning the, the, the resolution of this, this target sensor in vertical and horizontal. This basically gives us an emulated point cloud of uh, the other sensor. And by doing this, we can use the already recorded data to generate data from a new sensor. And of course, we can reuse the samples or the labels that we already have in the previous data sets. We show you an example. So this is uh, data from Bosch LiDAR. And uh, this Bosch LiDAR was not present in the, in the, um, in the data set before, in the label data set. On the left-hand side, we can see uh, object detection result on this Bosch LiDAR if we just train on the source domain. So on the other uh, LiDAR sensors, for example, Relodyne, Insight, and so on. And as you can see, we miss a lot of objects, even objects which are directly in front of the cars, motorcycles. We also have confusion concerning the class. So the object thinks this is a bus, but it is a truck. So it's really not such a good result. But if we train on the emulated data using the same data set size, same scenarios, same labels, just emulated data, we are able to detect them afterwards using this framework. So we see with the motorcyclers, we recognize that there's a truck instead of a bus, we have the car in front of us, and so on. And this is not just in this one frame, so it is really consistent. So these are single frame results. Uh, there's, there's nothing tracked, but as you can see, we are able to detect the, those objects even in larger distance. Whereas in the original setup, this was not possible. So let me conclude this sensor emulation. So what is really nice about this is that you don't need any label data for the new sensor. You can directly use what you already have and just emulate the new sensor using the old data. The only thing you need is a LiDAR sensor specification where you have to know the resolution, the field of view, and so on. And by the way, we apply this emulation also in our online league. We are able to drive around with the online league with some virtual sensor that is not equipped or not built into the car. So we can already test the sensor even before it is mounted into the car. And we can also test different mounting positions, for example, because the same approach can be applied also to, to check different mounting positions. The good thing about this approach is that it directly focuses on the main origin of this problem. Yeah, it it uh, focuses on the missing point problem, on the different specifications of the sensors. The cons Cons are that this emulation, at least the easy one that I presented, does not take into account point cloud intensity, so the reflectivity of the object it is not modeled here. And it has some prerequisites because it works best if the sensor that is to be emulated is somehow a subset of the sensors that have to be recorded. So always keep in mind if you record new data sets use a lot of sensors on your on your car to record them because this makes life easier afterwards. Okay, so then come to the conclusion. Um, yeah, 
I mean, there, there are a lot of different domain gaps available. Fabian also mentioned uh, some of them in the opening, as I said. In the best case, we have labeled each other domain data available for, the, for, um, for the, these domain gaps. But quite often, this is not the case. And uh, it will not scale to always produce such labeled data. In the second best case, you have at least data available from the private domain. So at least data from the new sensor of the new environment. If this is the case, then there are some domain adaption approaches that you can uh, apply. In the worst case, you have nothing available from the private domain. But even for this case, there are also some domain adaption approaches. And I, I have just shown three of them. There's basically a whole continuum of approaches. So there are much more out there. And what is important to say is, they are not exclusive to each other. So obviously you can combine them with each other. And you should also think of using them as a general augmentation task. So even if you do not encounter a domain shift, what we have seen in our experiments, it also improves performance in the, uh, in the source domain. So they can also serve a simple augmentation technique. What is important uh, from my point of view is that you first try to understand where the gap comes from. Because only if you understand where the gap comes from, you are able to choose the best domain adaption approach. I would like to recommend this paper of, of Chessman, so a co worker of mine, who really investigated different domain gaps uh, for LIDAR object detection, not just during inference time, but also during training time. And this is quite interesting because. During training time, there's a totally different domain uh, uh, domain gap than during inference time. Yeah, and that's basically all. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and of course the the guys and girls who, who did this work. So especially Chesman, D, Thomas, and Gloria. And if you're interested to get in touch with them, or also with the other colleagues from my team. And you are invited to, to visit us also at the conference booth in the next days, in the main conference days, where we will also present some more research that we are doing. And pretty sure that there is also something interesting for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Claudius. Yeah. Are there any questions? One question is regarding the inference gap. Um, you showed that you could quite significantly reduce it, and I was wondering how much reduction has an how much effect in the in the results in the application. Like if you like if you say you have single frame results and you can aggregate and you can use some other post processing techniques to make it better, where are the wins? Like what what is the most effective way of getting a better system in the end? Difficult. This basically also boils down to the question, what's the correct metric in measuring the performance? And at least what we saw is you have to take care if you just consider mean average position, especially on the public data sets. So if you if you submit to new scenes, for example, I mean, new scenes is cool and it's really important that it is out there, but uh, I think they just evaluate up to 50 meter or for pedestrians up to 40 meter. If you want to have an automated car that drives in the city, you need to detect pedestrians in 70 meters, 100 meters or so. So it's not sufficient what is currently covered by those metrics. What is really important in, in my, um, from my point of view is that you go into the vehicle and test it in the real world. And that's why we are closely co cooperating with those projects that, that build those vehicles and have constant feedback loops. So we, direct, we just deploy our models, they go out, try, and when they come back, we are pretty sure that they found some situations where it did not work. And those situations are then just enter the development again. I think there's no, well, uh, at least no, no metric out there or so that, that we could use to identify things. Except for an anomaly detection, for example, yeah, mm. or uncertainty estimation, mm. this could be used. Yeah. That, that's actually my question. So, whether you would, you know, think about using uncertainty or anomaly 
so that on the fly you could mm -hmm. just collect interesting samples. We do. We do. Okay. Yeah. And and do you think it's possible like to adapt the model on the fly or this would make no sense? Like not on the fly like in one second, but you know, just collect and let it, you know, without human intervention adapt the model. Oh, without human intervention. Yeah, I mean I mean there there are also some some I mean, if you collect the data, you somehow have to label in some way, either human labeled or auto labeled, of course. If you apply the auto labeling, you could do it automatically, but not in the car. So we would collect the data, we have some constitutory data, say or, or select what is important, and based on this, we might just retrain the model. Just to and sure. this retraining you see it there, we cannot get rid of it, right? We, we need to adapt the model again and again, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there, definitely there are also some situations where you can think of more <laughs> continual learning, okay, not um, well, collect all the data sets and keep them as they are, but just let them using new data. Um, there are some use cases which make that necessary but i think the, the the main scheme is more that you just collect the large data and retrain it from scratch okay. yeah yeah first. regarding sensor gap mm -hmm. um how to minimize the domain gap between the sen rider sensor which are mounted concrete different positions such as the blue glider and the front glider Difficult. So the best, the best that we, um, best approach that we found is really the sensor emulation. So we have data sets collected with really a super set of sensors, not just in the roof, but also in the bumper, for example. And if you have this, then you can emulate sensors. This is what we uh, realized is best. Of course, if you investigate different sensor mounting positions, then you have to add something to the approach that we uh, that I have just shown or to do some inclusion handling, for example. Um, but you need this. Otherwise, the gap from a roof mounted glider to bumper mounted glider is simply too big. So the data looks totally different due to the inclusions, basically. Thank you. Uh, also regarding the sensor of the main gap, um, our survey that we conducted showed that the trend in the sensors was for spare layers, while all the papers that were published always showed a adaptation from high resolution to low resolution. Uh, so you also presented mm -hmm. that direction. So I wanted to know uh, first, why do you think all the papers papers only carry that direction, and second, to what extent does your method uh, it could be applied to yeah. the yeah. So basically, the method works in both directions. I assume that most of the papers choose the other ones, which is maybe not so much of importance uh, because uh, simply the domain gap is larger. It gets much more difficult uh, if you reduce the resolution. Uh, um, but um, what's so what we found? Uh, this is done in this, in this paper again, uh, is even if you train on a low resolution sensor and you apply it afterwards on a high resolution sensor, you get better results actually. Yeah, and this is just due to the fact that you have more points on the object. So training on low resolution and evaluating or inferring on the high resolution sensor gives you better results. So as soon as you increase your resolution, during one time or during appearance time, the performance improves. But this doesn't mean that there's no uh, a domain gap. So there's still a domain gap because you would get even better results if you would directly train on the high resolution center. So you actually uh, did the experiments and got the results? Because uh, I think yeah. I only found one paper, it was from Google, that uh, reported both sides and they had the opposite uh, performances. No, they did. They did. Ah, okay. Great. Yeah. So it's there. Yeah. But uh, 
you're you're right. The other direction is the more important or more interesting one. Usually, sensors get better over time, and we're interested in, in reusing the old data for the higher resolution. Maybe just about that line. So there are two options to train on high resolution and deploy on low resolution. The other is you, let's say you even train and deploy both on low resolution, like which one is better? Train, so if, if your target sensor is the low resolution sensor, you should train on the low resolution sensor. Okay. This is uh, the different gap that I mentioned before, the difference in training and inference. During inference, it's always better to use more more uh, points, have a, a higher point cloud density. But during training, it's important to use or get as close to the target domain as possible. And if you have a low resolution as a target, then you should also train on the low resolution. But then, is that, would, would it be safe to say that is when you deploy a detector, you always need to make sure that the LIDAR you work with has at least the same amount of resolution compared to uh, it's the, the data set that the, the detector is trying on. I mean, it can be higher. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, it, if it gets higher, you get a better performance, but you would get an even better performance if you, if you would directly train on the higher, higher resolution. So it's always better, of course, to train on the sensor that is your target. But if this if this is not the case, then yes. Sorry, maybe I have another question. There's an emulated uh, uh, lidar. So you show that you train this emulated data. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering if it's possible you train this original data and during inference you artificially upsample uh, the low resolution lidar to a high resolution and uh, using this emulated. Would that work? Good question, yeah. Should work. Okay, then you didn't, you didn't try. Sure, I, I think that would be very advantageous that you don't, you have this pre shape, shape of pre training. Yeah, uh, could be, could be. I mean, there is some, there is some approach out there uh, which, which is called uh, semantic point generation, I think, lighter semantic point generation. If this does something in this direction. Um, but it's not the outstanding thing in the way that we. How we did it, they used the network to upsell the, the point cloud and reported some, some positive effects. Um, to be honest, we couldn't, uh, but we also tried this approach that has been uh, um, and proposed, and we couldn't find any benefit of it. So we couldn't achieve the results that they reported. But it could be that you could use this emulation approach. So if you try, let me know whether it works. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you. The last question. Yeah, yeah. Hey, just a short one. Yeah. Because one of the points that you made, which I apologize for my uh, voice, <laughs> but uh, one of the points that you made is it's the density, right? You analyze the gap. And are you saying with that, because that's your, your augmentation method seems to imply it's about subsampling. But if I think about weather conditions, um, there might also be reflections that occur. The structure might have changed as well, right? Um, so did you look into this and what's the conclusion? The problem is the density, but the structure is still the same? Or are there, should we also look in other types of uh, augmentation? Um, I, mean, I mean, density is one fact. There are also situations uh, where structure plays a role. Uh, quite um, good example for this is, uh, is if you have a red street, you have spray behind uh, behind the, the cars, which you haven't seen before. If you just have a, 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 a clear weather data, and this spray usually produces some false positives for ghost objects, even directly behind your own car. So behind the old car, it's basically uh, yeah, even even reverse situation. So uh, this means that it's not sufficient to just have a look at the density. You also have to make sure that you have at least some kind of situations that are in this emulator. So if, if your network has never seen spray before, the emulation approach also doesn't produce spray. 
Yeah, so that you need this data. What you basically need is, is a mix of, of everything. Yeah? So real data, played with data, such domain adaption approaches, also simulated data. I think uh, you cannot discard any of them. Good. Thanks a lot, Laurence. <laughs>